So now we come to everything up till now has been recorded. This one, folks, is going to be completely live. And I said that Celestia's talk was my favorite, and I still love it. But I think this is going to be really, really cool because this is something that you don't get every day, folks, for a couple of reasons. Um, what we're going to have right now is um, we're going to have James Tynan IV, and he'll correct me on that mispronunciation. Uh, <laughs> come on. He is the writer of a book for Image Comics called The Department of Truth. And a lot of this, pretty much everything we've done today has been about trying to educate through pop culture, trying to educate through entertainment. And uh, James is actually doing it, man. He's out there and his book is wildly successful because it's very, very good. Uh, <laughs> and it's uh, getting, to, uh, getting to people, getting to teach people about conspiracy theories uh, who might not think too hard about them otherwise. So we're gonna bring James on here and we're gonna talk for a little bit. And then we're gonna, if you haven't seen it, uh, we have, we've been doing every issue of uh, Department of Truth. I've been having uh, an expert come in to either uh, provide some insight or write an article themselves about uh, the particular conspiracy theory that uh, is in that issue. So we're gonna have four awesome people come on and uh, we'll get to them uh, when we get to them. But first, I'm gonna find James and bring him up here. Okay, James, you should be unmuted now. Hey, how's it going? There he is. Uh, <laughs> thanks so much for being here. This is a distinct pleasure. Uh, and we are very grateful that you do what you do. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Um, so um, I'll let you, unless you don't want to for some reason, I'll let you kind of describe the book, The Department of Truth, the premise of it. Uh, oh, boy. <laughs> uh yeah so i mean i think what's the best way to describe it uh the department of truth is about a secret agency that is somewhat a part of the united states government that uh is trying to prevent uh conspiracy theories from becoming true because the underlying idea of the series is that uh the world is operating on, uh, you know, on collective belief. The more people who believe something, it becomes literally true in that reality. So the most dangerous thing in that reality are dangerous conspiracy theories that spread. And then all of a sudden, if enough people believe them, uh, the balance will tip and all of a sudden the horrifying things they believe will become true. Uh, and this is an agency that purports to be on the side of good that is trying to make sure that the right truths stay true. And the book also deals a little bit about the larger question of should an organization be deciding what's true and what is not true? And especially should, you know, that government have ties to the United States and all of that. There, there are a bunch of different uh, levels to it. But, uh, but yeah, it's sort of it's the story of this young man uh, named uh, Cole Turner, who is kind of being taken down the rabbit hole. Uh, and, and, you know, exploring this entire world of conspiracy theories. And uh, yeah, <laughs> how, how did I do? How, yeah. how was that? Oh, uh, perfect. Um, <laughs> a little longer than the elevator pitch I've already gotten off, but you know, <laughs> that was pretty good. Um, uh, so well, we kind of dance around the idea of a tulpa, of something that is brought into existence uh, just by thoughts. Which is a little, and I, you know, nobody knows this because it's buried in a Monster Talk episode. A woman named Natasha Mickles, uh, uh, Eastern religion scholar, actually went and talked to the Buddhists and said, no, the Tulpa isn't really that. But it's the basic, same basic idea of thought forms. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, so um, how did you get interested in this sort of stuff to begin with? Well, there's a there's a few different levels of getting interested in this kind of stuff like because you know first off it's I was a kid who you know growing up in the early 90s and I think uh it had a bit to do with uh a general like UFO boom around then around the launch of the X-Files that either like was set off by the X-Files or inspired the X-Files or a little bit of both but I remember in my middle school 
there was an entire shelf of books that on the, on there that was that were about cryptids, were about UFOs, and were about uh, all sorts of you know strange but true, and uh, you know true uh, with uh, scare quotes right there. But uh, I was fascinated by all of it because you know I was a weird kid. I liked the. I liked esoteric thought because it was outside the norm and it was sort of, you know, it was, it, it was incredibly interesting. There's a whole like school of thought and, uh, you know, history to all of it that, that, that is tangible while being intangible at the same time. It's where this kind of fact and fiction meets in this weird esoteric blend that I was deeply fascinated as, in as a kid. Uh, and, you know, and I like and I think that fascination actually was one of the things that pointed me towards comics, because comics is built on all of those sorts of ideas. Like, you know, you look at early uh, Marvel in particular, and it's, you know, and early DC, it's the early DC, it's even more so it's the like, you know, based on the ideas of uh, you know, magic from that time and like secret societies and all of that, it's all built into it. And then once Marvel comes around and uh, starts bringing in, like the, the history of the Marvel universe is a conspiracy theorist history of the world. It's filled with hollow earths and like secret societies and, uh, you know, alien, uh, like aliens uh, affecting the, <laughs> the course of human history. So you know, all of that kind of led me into the comics world. And then I kind of drifted away from the source material for a number of years. Um, so so th that's sort of the like prologue era. And then like what really got me, uh, you know, on the road to coming up with the Department of Truth was, uh, you know, I grew up uh like as a teenager then, uh, the books that made me want to write comics were the Vertigo comics of the 90s and early 2000s. And one thing that I loved about those books is that those books felt informative and they felt like you learned something while you were reading them. They weren't just like, it, they were taking a, a thing that I didn't know much about and then they were digging into everything connected to all of that. And Sandman was uh, a big one for me, so was Fables, so was, uh, you know, like, I mean, The Invisibles, all, like, all of the big ones, like, it's not a, <laughs> like, the very good ones are the ones that I, I, I really connected to, and uh, it really set me off and got me thinking about, like, the sort of books that I wanted to write, and one of the big things, like, as my career developed, uh, you know, I wasn't in a position to launch a book that could sort of go off and meander in a bunch of different directions because like those old Vertigo books could do. Like you kind of, these days, you don't really have the benefit of like going off on a tangent. Like you kind of have to go from point A to point B to point C uh, because you're probably not going to get more than, you know, 15 issues, like 30 if you're lucky. And you know, I wanted to do, I had this idea of this uh, conspiracy theory story uh, and that would allow me to like dig into the world of conspiracies as a, the lore of the series that I would kind of kind of unpack and, and all of that. And I wanted to, like, I wanted to recapture all of that. I'm sorry, I'm, I feel like I'm rambling in a few different No, ways. don't worry about it. Don't worry about it at all. This is the last thing we got today. So if you got to- <laughs> um, uh, Yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, well, I mean, it's funny. You say um, you kind of, well, <laughs> kind of a, a straight ahead story, although it was weird because you and I kind of first came into each other's orbits with your book, Ufology, which was, that was by Boom, I believe. Yeah. Boom Studios, which was, um, I know some people in the chat will be happy about this, kind of a love letter to Art Bell and uh, all those kinds of very strange things and who was the artist on that? Because it was really amazing. Um, uh, Matt Fox. And he actually okay. just came out with, uh, I'm blanking on the name. It's in the other room. He has a new graphic novel that just came out like a few weeks ago. So you should hunt that down. Yeah. If you like weird, trippy stuff, it, it should be right up everybody's alley. And um, the great thing is that uh, now you're one of the biggest writers in the world. And, uh, and uh, Department of Truth is a, a stunning success, right? Yeah, no, it's been, uh, it's been really wild. And I do think part of it is, is that there's, you know, 
despite this being a moment that is so like wrapped up in conspiracy, there still isn't a lot of media that engages with the history and the people around conspiracy theories. And I think a lot of people are fascinated by all this stuff uh, in the same way that they're fascinated with all of the weird corners of the world. Like we've had this huge uh, true crime moment over the last like five years in particular, uh, but it hasn't reached over into the other like, you know, strange dark corners of the world, uh, you know, entering the, the mainstream a little bit. And so, you know, but I do think it's all connected because it's all kind of like, it's the weird fascinations. It's what, what do, what do humans get up to that's kind of outside the norm? And I, I think all of those things, there's a web of all, all of that kind of esoteric thought that I think is, and, you know, like, and then stuff that's, that branches out of it, like cults and all of that. It all kind of like gravitates around the, you know, one sun. And it is just like, you know, human curiosity. And uh, I wanted to, I wanted to live in that space a bit uh, because I'm a very curious person and I like to uh, dig into things and, you know, and I have, I have more plans to kind of keep exploring in these, uh, you know, strange dark realms uh, and, and see what sort of stories come out of it. And also like, you know, what resources, because that's the other thing is like trying to do the research for the department of truth. It just makes me more and more like frustrated that me as a middle schooler, I feel had better like resources than I do now because like the internet has become so centralized that you can't find the like like weird shit in the corners anymore. Like, and that's where all of this used to live. And there's, you know, there, there are good things that you can't find in the (laughs) dark corner. It's there are things that it's good that you can't find in the dark corners, but then there, obviously it's not really stopping, you know, dangerous thought from spreading. And I think see, like, I think honestly, the lack of access to the entire history of conspiracy thought makes people more susceptible to falling into it Um, because you don't realize like once you realize that the satanic panic happens like once every 30 years and has for 500 years like it it become you become a little less susceptible to it Um, and you start realizing who does it benefit to like actually make people believe that and that that was one of the, the real central driving things with Department of Truth, because, you know, I can't control the reader. I can't control the reader and make them, you know, interact with the piece in the way that I want them to. But the hope with Department of Truth is that it's not a book that people pick up and it's like, oh, this is why I believe in this crazy conspiracy theory. It's the one where they start, it, it's, hopefully they pick it up and be like, oh, wait, like that I'm actually thinking about who benefits by making people believe in this conspiracy theory. And that is the the central driving thing that I wanted to dig into. Yeah. Have you ever seen the uh, the QAnon uh, special on HBO? I believe it was where yeah. they got in there with um, those guys in the Philippines. I forget their names offhand. Who may or may not be the Watkins. Who may or may not be behind QAnon? Uh, yeah, it's a fascinating look into their psychology for sure. Um, well, that seems as good a time to any, as any to bring our uh, conspiracy experts on. But first, um, speaking of the success of Department of Truth, TV show? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, we, we announced at the start of the year that it's in development uh, with Sister, who did the amazing Chernobyl series on HBO. Uh, yeah. with, like, we don't have a network set up. Uh, we do have a, like, you know, I'm working with a great writer developing uh, the series right now. Like, the series will be you know, the, the series as it exists in the comics, like needs, like it, it's a difference, like, and this was one of those things where, uh, when we had all of those conversations, uh, to try to find the right home for it, 
it was me saying over and over, it's like the model that I'm laying out in the comics would not work in a direct adaptation. It just wouldn't. It's like Cole is too passive of a lead. It's because I'm like, it is an Alice in Wonderland story. Cole is going is going deeper and deeper into the abyss and ultimately he'll need to make a decision. And, but that actually, that isn't compelling. <laughs> like that's compelling issue to issue in small serialized bursts, but it's less compelling in, uh, you know, actually getting people to tune in every week. So like, that's been one of the interesting things is how do you find the beating heart of this thing and then uh, extrapolate it for a new medium, which is exciting. Like, I love that sort of stuff. I, I don't like direct adaptations, honestly. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, I mean, check out this guy behind me. I, I feel you about direct adaptations. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, um, so let's go ahead and bring on... Uh, Bring on some cool folks. This is, uh, I'm going to unmute Bob Blaskowitz right now, who um, is a professor of critical thinking and first year studies at Stockton University in New Jersey. Um, he has written for uh, Skeptical Inquirer and a whole bunch of things. And for us, for AIPT, he did the article on um, the Denver International Airport and all the nefarious things going on under there. And he oh, yeah. out with, um, in my opinion, the most emotionally difficult issue of uh, your book, Department of Truth, about uh, Sandy Hook and yeah. their false flag sure. attacks. Bob, say hi. Howdy. Hey, Bob. <laughs> nice to meet you. Same here. Uh, um, and then we're going to go on to um, the superstar of all this. She's written three things about your book already. Uh, games uh this is uh stephanie Kammerer. she also has the uh, cover story on a recent issue of skeptical inquirer all about QAnon. she also dug into uh the phantom time hypothesis and a little bit about black helicopters too uh stephanie right. did i miss yes you? thank you <laughs> <laughs> all right hey. And uh, let's go to blake smith who you've already met uh, if people have been watching the whole thing today Blake is, of course, the host of the 10 Year Strong Parsec award-winning podcast, Monster Talk, the science show about monsters. And yet, despite that, um, he was my main source for one of my favorite topics, the men in black. Are you there, Blake? I am. It's good to be here. Thanks. Excellent. Hey, Blake. Excellent. Hey, Blake. And... Nice to meet you. Hey, Bob. My <laughs> God, you're here. here. Yeah. <laughs> I know, Let's right? Look at this. Oh, my God. Okay. Oh, my it's, it's... <laughs> It's like a family reunion. In fact, we got one more. Um, this is uh, Jeb J. Card. He wrote. He's an archaeologist, the writer of the book Spooky Archaeology, and um, I talked to him. Jeb, the article is not up yet uh, because I'm very, very lazy. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say it's going to be out Wednesday, so now I'm committed. Uh, he helped me out writing about well, the latest issue of Department of Truth number ten and number eleven still to come is about Bigfoot and cryptids in general. So I got some great stuff from Jeb about paranormal Bigfoot. Paranormal <laughs> Bigfoot <laughs> is the only Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. All right, so we've got everybody in one room. This is amazing. I, I kind of just want to kick up and, and watch you guys uh, talk. Uh, James, do you have any questions for any of our uh, panel of experts here? Oh boy, I like, I'm just, I, I, I'm, uh, I don't have anything right off the top of my head, but I want to hear <laughs> what, like, it, it is like, I don't know. I, I really appreciate uh, the way that uh, you all have been engaging with the work and the, you know, uh, the, like, like Department of Truth is definitely the most research heavy book. Uh, that I work on and it's something that I know I'm not gonna ever get a hundred percent right uh, but I I really you know like I appreciate that there seems to be an appreciation that like I'm, I'm aiming for right uh, right as as much as it's definable and uh, yeah I, I want to hear uh, what what you all well, I'll tell you what then uh, let's yeah. let's not let's not bury the lead Jeb if you're there let's talk about paranormal Bigfoot can we please yeah, uh, we can do that. But but actually something I wanted to ask, you, yeah. you know, we talked about tulpas and I did, by the way, put the link in for folks at home uh, to uh, Blake and Karen show Monster Talk when they talk to uh, 
uh, Natasha Nichols and um, Joseph Laycock about how tulpas got mangled by people like John Keel and Evan Wentz and all of that. Um, have you noticed that egregores have started to come back, like the kind of mass version of tulpas? Have you seen this? I haven't. What, what yeah, is that? So it's basically the same concept as tulpas, but instead of the, I went to Tibet and conjured up a monk and then it had thoughts, the nation of Spain conjured up a thing and had <laughs> right yeah if, 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 if uh if if we were like being attacked and paul bunyan came out to the harbor and fought off the enemy ships like you know that sort of thing okay yeah. all right i really i'm very excited to dig into this that, <laughs> yeah, that... Like, like enigma well, let's all take in the egregorian chance yeah yeah so. <laughs> uh, oh yeah no that's uh that's freaking amazing um Sorry, yeah. I was coughing and I muted, and then there's <laughs> yeah. a co-host reasons I couldn't unmute. That's what happened there. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> yeah no, I um, I talked to Russ a couple of weeks ago about the paranormal Bigfoot thing. Uh, can you explain a little more what you're doing with it and why you went that way, other than just that we know a lot about how biology actually works? Um, I mean, I think uh, one thing is is that like I definitely wanted to like the everything in the series kind of points back to the central, like the North compass of the, of the series, which is the idea of a belief shaped reality. And so the idea of like, even in a world where, uh, you know, like the big thing that I wanted to explore with, uh, with Bigfoot and like, I wanted to use Bigfoot as a lens to explore all cryptids and all encounters and sort of explain how they work in this world. And it is something where I am leaning into, uh, like they are kind of a uh, case study of how the strangest corners of the, um, you know, of this belief system and the rules of the fictional world that I'm building uh, work. And it's also something that uh, you know, readers will like, I am, I'm telling the readers the rules of how tulpas work in this instance, uh, to make them better informed of how the, they will work in another instance a little bit down the road. So it's one of those things where I wanted to, uh, I also just wanted to see Martin Simmons draw a big foot. So it was one of those things where it's like, I wanted to, I, I wanted to plug into, uh, you know, I wanted to plug into cryptids, but I also like cryptids fall in such a different uh, lens, I think, than a lot of the, you know, like they're the, like they, they do. I'm trying to figure out the, sorry, <laughs> I'm like stumbling over. Well, I think I can help you here yes, in case please. you're still writing episodes. Remember, Nick Redfern has said that Nessie is a tulpa ghost. Oh yes, I a, I, go, a ghost of a dinosaur. Yes, uh -huh. I absolutely. And by the way, some people were mentioning the Mothman shirt. There is more. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I was a little proud when I found that. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, no. I mean, I think it makes. So uh, one of the things I think that that makes a lot of this make sense is for so many people, they're they're. For so many people of, frankly, the age of a lot of the people in this talk, let's put it that way, um, their entryway into paranormal stuff was a lot of paranormal media in the 70s and 80s and all of that, which was the tail end of what I at least think is there's a lens of at least an attempt at materialism, that UFOs are little gray or green people from tin cans and outer space and maybe a little more like Star Trek, um, stone tape theory just got mentioned, you know, like, oh, ghosts are not super occult. They are <clears throat> electromagnetic waves, you know, trapped in quartz crystals. And these are ancient dinosaurs that somehow survived in a Scottish glacial lake with um, a reporter that was the only person who ever talked about them for years. But we will digress about Alex Campbell. Um, but all these things, theosophy got brought up earlier, um, though it was a sort of a reference. Other things, all of this traces back to that. And there's basically, I would argue, a bubble in the middle of the 20th century that says, oh, all these things are almost science. And that bubble has popped. Yeah. 
I absolutely believe it. And it, I think it was always under there. People like Stan Gordon. Um, uh, I mean, we all, obviously, we're all talking about Keel, Ivan Sanderson. They knew it, you know, yeah. Jacques Vallée, I'm sure at some point. But uh, it, we're in a very different world. And I think one of the hard things to talk about this with people who are not in this world is you're laying out all these rules. You're laying all these things. And that's cool because they've not heard that because when they still go to, you know, the front page of the goddamn New York Times, they've Whoops. got government aliens um, and, and all of that repeatedly. Uh, but if you actually pay attention and do all the research, I want to ask you a question. How much of the research hurt? <laughs> <laughs> In the sense that as you're looking into these things and you're like, oh, I really like this and this is cool. And then you start looking into like, you know, we brought up Richard Shaver earlier and you're like, Oh, this is this is where UFOs come from. <clears throat> yeah, no, it's uh, it does hurt. It is it is one of those things where they, you know, and especially like if I started the book like in you know book issue three, digging into Sandy Hook and all of that, and that, but then oh, even oh. off in the like more uh, even in the more like quote unquote wondrous like corners of esoteric belief you find a lot of uh you know there, there are a lot of there are a lot of different like the ideas like it, i understand the drive that led towards the bubble you were talking about the idea that it was just like oh my god like here's there's this possibility of these like very grounded like central things that will like we won't have to give up the way we look at the world in order to accept these things into the world as we understand it. Uh, but then that starts to uh, you see you see the different ways in which that can start uh, falling apart uh, in both uh, the way people look at the world and also the people doing the looking. Like it starts uh, like personal stories start becoming like deeply affecting, and that's. You know, one of the one of the questions you started with was how, like, why did I choose to tell the Bigfoot story that way? Is part of it is I wanted to uh, tell a very human story about the pursuit of something ephemeral, like in which they, that you can never hold in your hands, and the 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 lifetime pursuit of something that just you're never going to be able able to fully grasp. And I think that that is like both that can be both the appeal of of sort of walking walking through these worlds and also that's the that's the danger like and that's the like the it is it is something that like department of truth is not like writing the department of truth is not like made me a more like optimistic person about the nature of humanity uh like <laughs> uh well, i mean fact, speaking honestly, of honestly it goes doubly so for the the you know the like you know the the political side of, dark stuff yeah the the real like and how many threads lead to the that dark the very dark threads of thought yeah. and you mm -hmm. know the ways all of the like all the as you dig deeper all of the different rabbit holes start connecting and like funneling towards places because we're a pattern yeah. finding animal that like wants to create how many influential paranormal books on my shelves end up being, oh, by the way, here's the appendix where we reprint the protocols of the elders of Zion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, speaking, of that, spe speaking of that, I, we talked about this, James, in our previous interview. You were researching QAnon and writing the QAnon issue, which I believe is number five, long before January 6th and most of the rest of the world first became aware of QAnon. And... Uh, so what was your reaction like on that day when the rest of the world kind of caught up to you? I mean, it's, you know, like, I mean, it didn't feel good. Um, and <laughs> it, it was <laughs> the worst I was right moment. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, I it, hate being right. <laughs> yeah, no, and it, it is one of those things where like one of the original ideas that I was going to go with that I kind of, I softened in the first arc. Uh, and, you know, I think there are threads that will kind of still echo the original idea as the series develops. But, you know, when I started working on the book, it was during that 
uh, you know, the lull that QAnon was was in before it picked steam up, uh, you know, in like during the quarantine, I think it it dialed mm-hmm. all of the notches back up to a hundred. That plus the election, and, and then all of it. So, um, you know, but it, for a little while, it seemed like it had kind of it was the there was had been PizzaGate, and then that died down, and then a second wave of PizzaGate came up a, as QAnon, and that was sort of the um the thing but then that had kind of died down and the the thing that it had fa- always fascinated me about Q- QAnon was a bit more of the the fact that it was like uh an ARG in the like 1999 to 2004 mode without anybody like actually like without a head even if there was someone kind of nudging people in directions it was like this headless conspiracy that was just like of just human pattern recognition without any like you know with like wildly out of control (laughs) like and it is something that like on that level in that kind of you know because I've always been fascinated uh with how uh you know like how ideas spread online like that is one of the like that's a deep fascination and it scares the shit out of me like that is the uh, one of the things that, you know, one of my earliest comic series was this book called Mimetic, which was about an image posted online that ends the world in three days. And it's like the idea of how uh, an idea can spread as a meme, like faster than it can be like actually understood or broken down and all of that. And then once it spreads, you can't unspread an idea. And it's just like, we are more connected than ever. We are making connections faster than we ever have, but we're also like, you know, shitty little meat computers that can't actually like process all of this information. And so we build our own narratives that we lay down on top of of it all that in ways that feel true. And, And then we're blind to the fact that there's, you know, like that, that is, you know, that it's all being encouraged just to like, you know, hurt them. Like, I don't know. It's, and there's a, there's a lot of confirmation bias in there too, where like, you can find if you have a belief, whether whatever it's about, whether it's a mostly harmless belief or a belief about you think a certain group of people aren't very nice, you can find yeah. someone who will confirm that belief for you. And uh, yeah, QAnon does a lot of that today. Well, I want to go to Bob. Um, you, James, you mentioned Pizzagate before. I think Denver International Airport was a little bit of a proto Pizzagate. Uh, what, Bob, what is so scary about this airport? Well, the, the, uh, really not that much you know i i mean when you go and you visit the airport um you see planes landing and those are loud but <laughs> but that that doesn't mean that they're dangerous they mostly stay on the on the runways um so you don't have to worry about them biting you um but yeah no um th- what people find uh confusing is, is they look at this art that that is uh really striking um and it has a strong social uh, message, uh, and uh, it kind of has to be. Um, American mural art is uh, something. Oh, I, I'm. A, that's right. You guys are all figments. Uh, your your background my, is terrifying, Bob. I just mm. want to point that out. <laughs> <laughs> is it? Is it that, that from Homeland? No, no. Isn't uh, that from Homeland? I, I. It's a Google image, as far as I'm concerned. I'm pretty I, sure that's me, Homeland. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, <laughs> But um, yeah, so there's this uh, American mural art, uh, art in public spaces in order to catch the attention of people has to be kind of larger than life. Um, And when you look at um, uh, this very uh, uh, busy public space, uh, the the hallways of the Denver International Airport, which was a major expansion uh, west, um, you know, in some ways it's not surprising that people would misunderstand it. Um, you know, the, the, the artist uh, responsible for some of the most notorious art, uh, Leo Taguma, has this long history of writing about or of uh, uh, depicting social uh, justice issues. Uh, and uh, he has two murals in there. One is uh, 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 the one that people think is most sinister is the um, uh, Children of the World Dream of Peace, which, had, which they don't realize is a diptych that, that has two parts to it. And that it's all connected and tells one story. Um, uh, there, there is a, a kind of a Nazi-looking guy who's killing the dove of peace, and people tend to focus on him as like he's the 
the goal, you know, um, uh, 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 or he's the moral of the story. Um, and it's funny because it's like people know that art means something, you know, and and you kind of have this like folk interpretation of this art. Uh, uh, Wait, but Bob, if I may, these are also the same people that see demonic codes in furniture catalogs. Well, you know, well, okay, there's that's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but I think that somebody was trying somehow, like somehow yeah. they got the Illuminati in there. How did that? How did that happen? Well, the Illuminati are everywhere. Is the Illuminati even cool anymore? Or well, we had. Um, I have a lot of students who believe that the Illuminati are real, or at least have questions about the Illuminati when we when we talk about their you know their their yeah. background. Um, and I, I agree with James's point that when it, when people become aware of the history of these stories, um, that they they have a genealogy and that the, they you know uh, that there is a um, th they kind of remind me of like this flu virus. Um, uh, of uh, elements that swip, that that swap, you know, back and forth, you know, um, in, in the, the so if you think of the uh, New World Order conspiracy theory, which is a multi-phase, multifaceted conspiracy theory. Sometimes it's the Jews, sometimes it's the Jesuits, sometimes you know, um, uh, it, it's the communists uh, are are planning, and you can just mix, mix and match your your various elements um, to, to to produce endless. Uh, uh, varieties and of stories most frustrating, you know. Um, uh, I think if people realize that that there are some sticky ideas that are, are conducive to to spreading, um, people might have a little bit more resistance to it. I, I do I do think that 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 things like the Pizzagate and things like um, uh, and, and even ancient aliens and all these other uh, fanciful uh, ideas uh, did set us up for kind of a disaster um, over the last couple of years. I've been despairing as a critical thinking teacher. Um, uh, you know, you wonder what's the point sometime. No, it's, 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 a, I sometimes feel, cause I have courses where we talk about the importance of that. And I sometimes almost feel like, no, I know it's important, but how, Dude, my anesthesiologist believes in homeopathy. What am oh, I supposed no. to? Yeah. Oh, no. What oh, am no. I, you know? Well, um, wow, that's uh, scary. Have someone in surgery. the room. Yeah. Sure it goes okay? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Just, but, just give me enough, man. Well, here, here, you know, we've all been talking about ideas and how they get transferred, I think. Uh, and, and, but it seems to me that there's an ecosystem that has natural selection. Like there's the selective pressures for some ideas to be successful and others to not be. But in a world where rationalism or evaluating the ideas on their merits of whether they're plausible or not is not one of the factors, what are the selective pressures at play in the conspiracy world that are to start determining what's going to be the thing that catches on? Because it sure as hell has nothing to do with whether it's plausible. That's not yeah. the thing. So I don't, I don't, I... No, it's what feels good. It's yeah. what feels good to the most number of people. Like that is the, you know, like the it's what are what's the, the what are the theories that lean into what everyone kind of already thinks and then like it is it's like it's confirmation bias uh on, on like on a really frightening level like it like you know connected to the whole like new world order uh thing is like at a certain point you know to a to, to someone who like is you know inclined to want to live off the grid a little bit in like you know the early 90s it is someone who's just going to be like you know what yeah the cold war is over but the country's not like dismantling any of its like giant um military machine anywhere it's pouring more money into all of these like government forces and all of that and now it's not even to like beat a bad guy it's just to create this like you know, machine of like, you know, like it feels very logical that there is just like a, um, you know, that there's a group of people who have made a decision, a secret decision to like keep you down. And there's, there's an extent to which that's true, but the way in which it's true is that it's like the people making those decisions just don't give a shit about how it impacts the people down, down the ladder. And it's one of those things where like all these things have, 
Uh, so it's both the, the idea that it's like they are attacking me specifically because I can't uh, like dismantle the my belief structure enough to believe that I don't matter. And then also like that everyone like it, that all of my assumptions are true in the idea that like people are out to get me or trying to keep me down. Like, well, I think it's all that kind of emotional. Thing. I, I see that as being the, what you're describing there at the end seems to me to be more like clinical paranoia. It was like, they're out to get me. Right. Whereas it's in there. Conspiracy theories are, <laughs> are about ways of life, you know, like they're, 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 they're about uh, culture being destroyed or, uh, freedom or democracy being destroyed. And that allows people to have a very self-validating persona of I'm the one who's going to save the culture. Um, okay. Me and my, my uh, scrappy group of, of friends who, who, who see through it and, and know what's going on. And, and the other thing that we, at least in this country that we have that kind of um, uh, feeds into the, this is a very evangelical culture. Yeah. Um, where people have this idea that the truth will set you free. And if you just spread the word enough, you know, people will realize that, you know, that, that like that in itself will bring down the, uh, the, uh, the conspiracy. And when it doesn't happen, well, Jesus, the conspiracy is even bigger, yeah. you know? So. No, uh, not, yeah. there's, there's, there's two things here. One, you mentioned dismantling. And I think that's incredibly important because you, you said, oh, it's the thing that appeals to the most people. I would add as an addendum to that, it's the thing that appeals to most people where there's nothing standing against it, nothing that actually works. Yeah. So for example, I think this is one of the reasons why, and I made fun of the New York Times very rightfully <laughs> earlier about the UFOs, but there's no real thing standing against it other than, well, this video isn't real and that video is not real and that one. So that one's incredibly mimetic. Whereas you look at things like polls and whatnot and Bigfoot's like about 15, 20% because people are like, I know how animals work. Yeah, And um, what Bob was saying there about, it's not so much I think it's people out to get you, it's that there's nobody there to support you. I really do think there's an element of, it. but here's the kicker, it's not actual disenfranchisement. It's not material disenfranchisement. Oh, yeah. And QAnon, look at who's in it, it's upper middle class, mostly white people. Like there's, yeah. you but know. But, uh, but at the same time, I got to say, uh, in the very first article we did on Department of Truth, Mick West helped me out with that. And he did a pretty good job of convincing me that, like you said, James, uh, a lot of it is uh, was pandemic stuff. It was people being stuck alone. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe something other uh, else bad happened to you. And you start to look for a why, like you said, with the pattern recognition. So I think that's definitely a part of it. Uh, Stephanie, I want to go to you. Um, you've done some... Yeah, you've been the hero of our uh, series of articles on Department of Truth. You wrote about QAnon. You wrote about black helicopters. You wrote about the phantom time hypothesis. Nobody even knows what that is. Uh, <laughs> do you have any questions for James? Well, I, I just wanted to say what a pleasure it is to get to talk to you face to face. And I love the fact that your comic is being produced by the same comic that uh, brought back Tank Girl. So, um, <laughs> um, I, I, and I know the answer to this one already, but I, I know when you did the QAnon thing, QAnon was first mentioned on page 17 and I, and I know you didn't intend that, but I gotta say that really sent me on a head spin. I was like, <laughs> QAnon is on 17. This cannot be a coincidence. That says yeah. it all right there. So I mean, yeah, funny. no, it really like when, when that was pointed out to me, I was like, I like I wish I had like done that deliberately. Never admit it wasn't purposeful. <laughs> <laughs> there are no coincidences. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but well, it, it's it, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, <laughs> I was gonna say, um, Tell us, why, why don't you tell us what, I'd like to hear you and James talk about the Phantom Time Hypothesis, because this is something that is really strange to me. Oh, yeah. That blew my mind. I never heard of it before, to be honest. <laughs> it's, I, I mean, it, like, I, I, it is a very fringe theory. It is not something that's, like, widely believed by, like, any group of people. It was, like, one German... A uh, historian who really tried to push it in the mid '90s, and it never really like went anywhere. But it is something that it's important for the um, you know larger mythology of uh, Department of Truth, and uh, you know how uh, 
you know, it's like the history is written by the victors. It's the literalization of that. And it's the and idea. The audience is, this is the, there's basically no middle ages thing. Yes. It, it's basically that, uh, the, that Charlemagne, uh, was created, was a fictional idea that was spread by the Catholic church, uh, to help unify all of these disparate, uh, kingdoms. They created a mythical King that had already united all of those kingdoms 200 years prior, and then started telling the story of that. So then when they crowned the new Holy Roman emperor, it wasn't the crowning of the first Holy Roman empire. He was it was the continuation of a threat. And one of the things that sort of points into that is there's limited actual archeological uh, archeological evidence of Charlemagne. I think there has been much more in the previ previous uh, 20 years, but there, there are a couple of things that are a little like, that's a hazy period of history um, because, you know, most of the people recording history were not in mainland, like we're not in central Europe at that time. Um, so it, it's one of those things where I wanted to lean in to that concept because A, I found it very fascinating and B, uh, the idea of creating fictional eras of history to kind of get over something is something that we do constantly. Um, even though we don't do it in a literal sense, like, you know, the, the best example that I always point to, and eventually I'll point to it in the, um, you know, in, in, in Department of Truth itself is that America did that by creating a fictional era of history called the Wild West, which <laughs> really only existed in some shape for like five years. Like it, it was a very short period of time, but we treat it culturally as this, like as, as a few decades long because it pushed the civil war deeper into the past. And it was basically, it's like, oh yeah, we had the civil war, we had this big, thing and then we went and wandered in the wilderness and then we came back and we were ready for the 20th century and it was just one of those things that it made us feel good because it also meant that we could point to a fictional history of like societal history rather than actually look at the history of reconstruction and it was just one of those things where like you know average kid in the early 20th century would knew more about cowboys than reconstruction and it was just like, that is like, so it's something that we do constantly. And I think the similar thing happened in the 1980s where basically, you know, America like had a collective, like, you know what, we're just going to pretend the 1970s didn't happen and everything's good again. And it's just like one of those things where there was this weird, like, you know, it, like a weird cultural flip. And that's something that, you know, as I talk more about the satanic panic, I want to talk more about where it was just, once again, it was the idea of like, trying to create a fictional present to override, uh, you know, a reality that people were uncomfortable. And, and Americans, I think, in particular, are more susceptible to fictions because America is like, a, you know, it, it's a, America is a story we all tell each other. It's not, you know, it's not like, oh, yes, this is, you know, our, our people have lived here for thousands and thousands of years. And that's why we're a country. We're a country because we, like, have the, a weird contradictory history of a bunch of like extremists leaving Europe and then trying to like decide like what society should look like in, in a different way so yeah no that like that's all the threads that that are that sort of pointed me in the direction of that uh that stuff so well, no, I, I know course, that was a lot of rant. but you, you you said it yourself I mean it's like really goes to show the lengths that conspiracy theorists will go to and the impenetrable defenses they have that somebody could believe that some that Charlemagne or whoever uh, somebody wrote Charlemagne out of history or created yeah. it uh when you, like you said I mean other people were recording history apparently yeah. people in Asia and everywhere else were not in on the joke oh yeah and the star record is the thing that totally dismantles it is yeah. the like the, the stars are in the position that they should be given like that the time is like there oh, aren't two, 300 missing years there just aren't and like the stars were recorded contemporaneously in especially like part of why that whole era in Europe was so like they were all freaking out was that was the Islamic golden age and it was one of those things where the center of like thought in the western world had moved east like and that freaked Europe out, um, and I don't know. So that's 
I did once have what? somebody get mad at me for not taking the missing time, uh, uh, the, the, the missing era seriously at an academic conference when we were talking oh, wow. about using these topics to teach critical thinking skills and how to think through things. Um, someone was like, well, you're just arrogant. And it's like, well, we have the tree rings, so no, I'm not. <laughs> but like, yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know what? Maybe that manu- that evidence was manufactured. Maybe the evidence has been taken away. Maybe by someone like the men in black, Blake? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I, if, if you, <laughs> I think we have to admit that history is a narrative construct. And if it weren't, yeah. how would we explain history books? Take that! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I do find it fascinating, though, because we I think in order to take the books of our uh, sort of the academic knowledge and, you know, generally well understood knowledge, you have to say, okay, I'm going to accept that expertise is real and I'm going to ignore sort of cultural norms if 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 they disagree. Right. But then you've got mythologies that have developed. So I mean, like a lot of what start out as weird stories become folklore, become myths. And for you to stand up and say, well, like UFOs, for example, if I say, well, that all really started with Kenneth Arnold. And then you just kind of go through and talk about, we, you know, Jeb and I have done a lot of work on you know, Ray Palmer and, and, and Shaver and all these other sort of influences. And you say, well, look, this is all coming out of the pulp magazines. But now it's like, no, 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 this is a secret history that they're trying to hide. And it's like, it, you know, the reality is if you really dig down, there's not much to many of these things, but they've developed this beautiful candy exterior of myth that just is too easy to swallow for most people. And I, 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 I despair of like trying to keep people on track uh, with like, like that, that we do share a real place in a real world with real history and that it's demonstrable through scientific methodologies or, or forensics, you know, or whatever. That, that the people who don't accept those modes of thinking, you know, we have to interact with them. They're in the same world as us, but they probably will more influence because we're actually kind of in a minority if we really like dig in to find out why we accept that this is the date, why we accept that we actually do have satellites, that the earth is spherical, that sort of thing. I mean, the, it's not everybody who takes the time to actually understand rather than accept it as approved knowledge you know well, yeah. and it's not just that we're in the minority blake it's we're in the minority when it comes to influencing people who are gatekeepers again december 2017 new york times ufos the people that wrote that are literally on the board of robert bigelow the guy yeah. who- again oh, yeah. the selective pressures that should be pushing the stuff away don't exist like i you know so that's my thought you know but I do like your comic. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's how we do it, right? I mean, yeah. comics will save the world. I've always said comics will save the world. So. I, I personally think that the that the COVID pandemic, the lockdowns and all that, it, well, I mean, this isn't just my personal opinion, but it was the harbinger for doom, not just because of deaths and, you know, quote unquote lockdowns and stuff. It increased, it, it, we, we saw what came in with that was what's now referred to as pastel QAnon, where the hot yoga, and I don't mean hot as an attractive, I mean like, you know, the, the yoga places Steamy. where you go yeah, to yeah. sweat. Yeah, yeah. It, those, those moms were getting pilled because of COVID and then all of a sudden the anti-vaxxers. So during the COVID lockdowns and all that, that's where you got what we would refer to as pastel QAnon, which is like the liberal yeah. QAnon people. And that is in some ways the most terrifying because it used to be, I could look at someone wearing a Grateful Dead shirt and go, oh, you're cool. Now I have to kind of somewhat wonder, are you really cool? <laughs> is, that a, is that a signal? Is that a QAnon signal? Oh, what? The well, Grateful no, no, Dead just shirt? like the the hippie movement is oh, where okay. pastel QAnon kind of oh. came about. Yeah, not to say horseshoe theory, but the the left and the right both have their own sort of things they're really wackadoodle about. So yeah, but it's get, weird though because um, like prior to QAnon and you know certain political things, uh, the whole anti vax stuff basically came from the left. It was kind of suburban moms. Yeah, had, Kennedy. I have to worry yeah, about anything. Yeah. yeah. And now all of a sudden it sort of then became a libertarian thing of you don't touch my body. And now I don't even know what's going on. Yeah. But but I mean, this is what happened before too. Like this is, uh, 
you know, the a lot of the 1960s, like, you know, uh, like Free Love and all of that, like it did kind of like, it turns into ultra individualism, which then all of a sudden, then what you feel matters more than what, like, you know about a thing. And then that, and then it's just like, it, it all become like, once you like switch over into that, it does become, uh, it becomes really corrosive. And it is something that it's just like that, you know, like all of these modes of like hyper individualism, like all started popping up around like it, like in the same era, it's just like, you know, it was a connection that, that I drew in another uh, issue of D mm -hmm. Department of Truth, which is just the idea that it's just like uh, Alistair Crowley and Ayn Rand were kind of saying the same thing. Like it is very much, it's just like do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. It is like what, you, you know, like what you want and what you think matters more than the little people and the sheep. Like, and, you know, and that's a very powerful idea that keeps popping up in all of these different corners. And then on top of that, it's also something that I think, you know, it, it leans into the American myth of like rugged individualism, like all of that sort of like all funnels together, like both on the left and on the right towards this like, you know, okay, like at a certain point, it just gets to like, okay, we're going to get a lot of guns and go to a cabin out in the woods and like wait for the government to come for us. Like it all kind of points in that direction. I'm, by the way, going to give away a creative idea I've been having. For years. I think I've told Blake this. Uh, I have had the horrifying nightmare story of the what if Ann Rand and H.P. Lovecraft became writing partners. <laughs> I, I love it i love somebody it. steal it go ahead I, I'm not a, I'm not a fiction writer except for when i'm accused of it <laughs> uh, uh, let's yeah. see who um, is john galt cthulhu for thing <laughs> <laughs> i i had a question for uh james um are you going to be tackling the jfk jr thing sometime oh soon <laughs> so, you mean our current vice president <laughs> yes <laughs> oh, Jesus christ oh god no i mean that is so i like i've read into it and it is just one of those things where there's not even like uh like it's like one picture of the guy kind of looks like it, it, from one Vincent. angle and it just like there isn't like even an interesting like rabbit hole to go down with it uh it's just kind of a lunatic thing that people have like <laughs> latched on to um but I mean, I, I will say, like, I am kind of, I'm, I am rearing back a little bit from the QAnon stuff in the, like, in the present day, just because I want to see, like, I want to talk about it when I start talking a bit more about, uh, you know, like, ultimately, I want to talk a little bit about the singularity and the ideas around, and, and algorithms, and both in the real way and the ideas surrounding them and what they're, are building towards and all of this stuff uh you know because there is i do i do think that there is a connection between the fact that we are now on all of these algorithmic platforms that are driving us to make connections we wouldn't make otherwise and i think it's speeding up the process and it's kind of taken on a life of its own uh it's one of those things where originally i was going to lean further into q with that and now i might talk about it a bit more generally uh, when I get to that in the comic, because it's something that like Q, especially as we learn more about it and the connection of like Jim and Ron Watkins and all of that stuff. It's like it's one of those things where it's just like I can't pretend that like, you know, QAnon is like a weird supercomputer like that, you know, my just Bannon villain is like yeah. behind Uh all, the, the villain of the series, Martin Barker, is very much like once we get into his history, it's, I keep referring to him as like, imagine if Steve Bannon was who Steve Bannon thinks he is, um, like, and just like actually wildly effective at everything. Uh, <laughs> that, I mean, which isn't to say he like, I do think Bannon is a very dangerous like, you know, in terms of what he's kicked off in a yeah. number of different corners. But it is one of those things where it's just like, he's not he was, quite as... Wasn't he trying to establish like an Italian military school or something? Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. No, yeah. Okay, yeah. Weird guy. Weird, weird yeah. guy. 
um and he yeah but i mean like down to the fact that like you know like proto gamergate stuff all of this stuff like there is a he's he was weirdly present in all of these different arenas well it's not surprising you know he's the child of hp lovecraft nine rand a lot of people don't know that (laughs) (laughs) and and honestly all all bannon all bannon needs is an eye patch and an all white cat and he is your your classic super villain oh yeah so Um, yeah he he really is and uh yeah i'm excited to to get to his uh his history in the comics because it's you know it, it is also the you know digging into the last hundred years of conspiracy about and within uh the like ultra wealthy in the country uh because that is that's its own like chain of conspiratorial thought that is like so important to the modern moment it's the oh god what uh the john birth society and everything that sort of started cooking in that uh and then broke out into the mainstream of the ultra wealthy in the 70s and then now we and then literally like you know uh one of the when i when i was like building the series uh like one of the big uh books that i made all my uh collaborators read was jane mayer's uh uh dark money because it was just like this is what an actual conspiracy looks like this is like mm-hmm. like not a conspiracy theory this is like a room of billionaires got together and decided things and then mm-hmm. worked over decades to achieve them and it's documentable like it's uh you know, it, it is one of those things where it's just like you, understanding the real, like the real, like cons- conspiracies as much as they are, and the, uh, you know, and then what people believe that the rich people are up to, like you know, in their like you know pizza dungeons, like <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's it, almost it's, it's almost kind of like it's almost kind of like a distraction. It's uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, James, have you looked at have you looked at both the Mellon family and the Rockefellers when it comes to their participation in UFO culture? I very much now. I'm very is, <laughs> yeah. Good I'm reading that too. Uh, well, Chris, Chris Chris Mellon is one of the TTSA people pushing this now. He you know, he shows up in the New York Times and Wapo at 60 Minutes, and there's a couple other members of the family that are interested in that as were, but the same people, uh, there was a Rockefeller that was in the 90s all into that. So again, not what the people say they're doing, but more as like just really (laughs) wealthy believers. But you might, if you're working down that road, you might just want to take some look at that. Yeah, Yeah, no, I absolutely will. And it's interesting how powerful people with weird beliefs can do weird things. Like look at Bigelow and Skinwalker Ranch and whatever other nonsense he gets up to. There's a, there was an event at Rockefeller's, this Rockefeller's house, and there's a photo and everyone you just alluded to is in the photo. <laughs> yeah. Like there's Linda Moulton Howe, there's Bigelow, there's so and so, there's uh, yeah. oh. and they all and they all got together to kill Epstein as we know. That's right. <laughs> um, Stephanie, I had a question. You mentioned the the pastel QAnon thing earlier. Was that mm-hmm. predominantly through like Instagram and social media? I I think I'm asking, I'm wondering about cuz there is a streaming network that has the name of a Greek goddess of the earth, in case this is going on YouTube later, that has that started as a yoga company, but then very much went into ancient aliens world. Was that influential or is it really just primarily like Instagram and stuff? I think a lot of it, well, it, when looking back on it, a lot of it was the algorithms on YouTube, which YouTube, yeah. I can personally attest is very pilling because I used to be a Sandy Hook truther and a 9-11 truther and now I'm not. Mm -hmm. So um, the the algorithms are really, really damaging and the um, autoplay is also very damaging. And um, it, it was part of that, but it was just this mass confusion. So everyone decided that they had their own opinion. And then you had these like new age influencers who are all of a sudden like jumping on the save the children yeah. train, which was that that was the essence of pastel yeah. was the save the children. And that all came about 
because our JFK junior buddy, Vincent Fusca, well, he wasn't the one, but he was one of the people who was saying that the pandemic was a cover to liberate the mole children from the deep underground military bases. And it, so, and- Won't that, someone and, think of the mole children? <laughs> well, hey, I've, <laughs> I've done that. I've done that meme. Like, so at least <laughs> the we got stranger started. things out of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stephanie, yeah. Stephanie, Stephanie. Uh, so you are, you say things like the articles you've written for me and, and just seeing what you do online. Uh, you've seen things that I can't even imagine. You are so deep into this stuff. Don't don't lose your mind, please. Um, I'm trying not to. We're gonna we're gonna wrap up in a little bit here. So let's try to lighten the mood. I think. What's the weirdest claim you've come across in in researching conspiracies? Oh my god. Um, I mean, it's it's one of those like that is, that's a really difficult question because it's one of those things where when, when like one of the closest things to the surface is shape-shifting reptilians. It's like the, yeah. the strangeness is like, it's so close to the surface in all of these theories. And that is like in a way that it, it almost strips away some of the novelty of the more unique uh, like beliefs because you can once you sort of see the whole map and how everything like connects to each other and it's just like it's how many how many times can we just like repackage the protocols of the elders of zion how many times can we just repackage the satanic panic and like those two could even are both repackaging of you know the blood libel from the uh, middle ages it's one of those things where you know like on a deep animalistic level i think we just have a fear of other and the fear of other is like it is the thing that we're we can be manipulated about the easiest and it is uh and it's something that just like it keeps spinning out from there and it's one of those things where it's just you know like i don't know it, it is like and it's it, there's a weird double-edged sword with all of this because obviously you know, I'm also like, I'm fascinated about all this stuff. I like, you know, I still have a childlike, uh, childlike love of like UFO stories, especially like, you know, uh, like strange encounter, like strange encounters with like things that can't be explained because I want to believe that there are things that you, that still are still unexplainable in the world. And it's just like that, that's something that it's like, I, I maintain from my childhood to present day, but then it's seeing how, how people take that and manipulate it. And it's also seeing how, uh, you know, culture takes a lot of these things and, uh, can also weirdly limit the thinking around all of it. Like once again, it's the idea of that bubble of like UFOs must be real metal ships that have like, you know, things in them that all of that, that fall around that are literally here rather than some kind of, you know, like it, some sort of byproduct of us. Like, and it's one of those things where it's just like those, I think those questions are fascinating because we have for the, hit time immemorial like encountered like very strange things or had encounters that we can't explain and all of that and i i want to be able to engage in and and like play in those sorts of worlds but i do think that there are uh i don't know it, it's like the uncomfortable areas are what i wanted to explore in in department of truth and in some of the other things that i'm exploring like i'm also really fascinated about the the end of the like in the Gilded Era, the, the prominence of spiritualism in the Gilded Era, like that is a whole era that is deeply fascinating to me because it was a similar confluence of like of power and esoteric thought, like that all kind of wove together in a really interesting way that it was all trying to express something very human, which is the fact that we just had the bloodiest war in Americans' his history and like a bunch of people had a bunch of dead people that they wanted to reach out to. Like, and it was... It's something like it's the history of strange beliefs is, I think, important. And I think it's something that in trying to uh, like cage that history, I understand the drive to cage that history because you don't don't want to spread the beliefs. 
like, but it's also one of those things where the history of those beliefs is the history of culture, is the history of like of human thinking over the last like 500 years. So it's one of those things where it's like, if you can engage with it in fiction and you can engage it in a nonfiction, it's like, how can you engage in all of it? And then all of a sudden you have a bunch of people encountering these ideas for the first time uh, as though they're real. And then all of a sudden you get, have people believing, uh, once again, it's just like bringing back the protocols of the elders of Zion, which was like utter bullshit in the 19th century and it's still bullshit today. Let's and it uh, is, yeah. Let's take some questions uh, from the chat. I noticed one come in here. Um, this might be for, well, whoever wants to field it, I'm gonna guess Stephanie might know the most. Uh, has Save Our Children broken away from Q or morphed to be its own thing? I still see people holding those signs, stickers on their cars that aren't political outside of that. Well, Save Save the Children was, it, it, and I believe it still is, a legitimate like organization, kind of like NICMEC, yeah. National it might Center be, for Missing. It might be Save Our Children, like slightly different. Right, but that's that's what well, part of the reason it's so sticky. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. They they kind of stole that, and it it it's sort of kind of become its own thing in a way. But now it's actually kind of morphing further, and this is going to ter terrify everyone. Now it's kind of morphing into free Britney because just like <laughs> save no, the children, <laughs> how could you? How could any person in the right mind, whether they like Britney or not, how could anyone disagree with her being released from her conservatorship? Yeah. So, and and it's kind of ironic that Matt Gates has his foot in the door. I had posted on Twitter the other day. Someone should tell Matt Gates that Britney is a full grown adult. Yeah, she's um, <laughs> <laughs> that, same, same thought. Same that thought. That makes so much sense. That's wow. <laughs> oh, I, and and I Britney, saw. Britney was one of the the Pizzagate uh, victims. She was a Pizzagate victim. <laughs> It, well, Project Monarch. She was oh, supposedly a control. part of. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look at Jeb. <laughs> Stephanie, I'm glad you're in those rabbit holes and not me. I could not keep myself. But you know, if they were I, talking about what's the weirdest thing, if you, if people yeah. were honest with their hashtags, then it would be it wouldn't be save our children. It'd be save our children from the reptilians who are drinking their blood, right? You know, yes. like so. Right. And, adrenochrome. And, right, adrenochrome <laughs> specifically, right? Extracted, yeah. right? Obviously, you keep them alive and fear, you know, full of fear, so they produce lots and lots. Um, Can't stop here. This is Mothman country. Well, but you gotta have like you know, like, obviously the length of the uh, the hashtags matters. But still, if 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 they were honest hashtags, it was like <laughs> hashtag honest hashtags. Yeah. Um, David Brook, who you probably know, James, he's our media manager at um, AIPT. Uh, he wants to know, given how much research you've done on conspiracy theories. Is there enough out there to continue the Department of Truth indefinitely? I want to believe the answer is no. <laughs> I mean, like indefinitely is a big word. Um, <laughs> like I, I will say that there, there's a enough material that this, like when I originally outlined the Department of Truth, I had effectively a 15 issue like run but then once like once the first issue came out and it was as successful as it was, I realized that I could expand that out. And so like the we haven't the second arc uh, that's currently happening was one that I didn't think I was originally going to be able to tell. Uh, and like, honestly, now that that second and third arc of, of what was originally the three volume version of Department of Truth will now be like well in the future. So. Uh, there is a lot more ground to cover. And I think that I don't want to extend out the, what, what is most likely to happen, I would say, is that, you know, Department of Truth at the current story cycle will be like around five, uh, five or six story arcs that, that tell kind of the full uh, story, like Cole Turner's story, uh, you know, Black Hat versus the Department of Truth. Once we get out beyond that, there are other eras that like tie into all of this, like the, you know, the founding of the Department of Truth uh, and then the predecessors of the Department of Truth. Like, you know, I, I remember there's one line that Martin makes fun of me and emails about in the original pitch document where it was just like, oh, if this is successful enough after that first 
like 15 issue arc that we could do a second 15 issue arc about the uh, Catholic church and like, you know, everything connected to like world religion and uh, you know, the central powers of like, and I, I say this as like, you know, I grew up Catholic and all that. So obviously like, you know, I, I was plugged into uh, like histories and conspiracy theories around the church, uh, which have always fascinated me. Uh, but it is something that, yes, there's a lot of material uh, here. And then on top of that, I think there are a lot of human stories to tell in and around this. And then on top of that, there are other comics that I'm developing that'll play with, uh, play in similar sandboxes, but from different angles. Um, you know, I might have uh, something, something in the UFO space that I'm, I'm interested to, I've been, that's been in my head for a while um, that, uh, you know, you, you all might be hearing about in the next few weeks. So. Oh, oh, I definitely want to hear about that. Um, <laughs> another deep question about the narrative here. Is there a chance we'll see more of Cole and Maddie's relationship? It would be nice yeah. to see things from Maddie's perspective. Yeah, no, I want to especially see what it's like for, you know, this is, what is the actual cost on the human relationship to see your partner going down, uh, like, a, a deep rabbit hole and getting caught up in, in that whole mix. So, um, I, that is a story that will be told and relatively soon in the book. Um, let's go to Dan Neustorf. Uh, are you familiar with Ukraine's broadcast used to refute current Russian disinformation? A little bit, but I, 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 I don't know how much more I know beyond the like broad, like summation that like, I, I, I've heard of a few like specifics, but not, uh, the full history of it. But I, you know, I, all, all of that kind of, uh, like, that sort of thing I find deeply yeah. fascinating. And Dan, uh, Dan, yeah. Dan also wants to know, wants to ask Bob, actually, is humor part of the toolkit of critical thinking to address conspiracy theories? No. No. I'm just kidding. No, I don't. I know. I, I think that it, in some ways, um, you can use humor. You have to be careful, though, because you, you might end up trampling on someone's particular beliefs uh, and treading harshly on them. Um, uh, you want to, I, I think of uh, Tim Minchin's Storm, um, uh, the, the, the short film Storm um, uh, and beat poem, where he sets up a, an attractive, smart, funny character who you want to identify with, right? Um, and that is, you know, um, and I think that that's kind of, it's a it's it's an appealing way to get people into your mindset. Um, I think it's, but I don't think that it's you know it's not logic, right? It, it it's it, it's not evidence based, right? Um, but you also have to, to draw people. Hmm, you have to be aware of um, and, and teach students, in my case, uh, to recognize when emotions are being manipulated in order to bring you along to, yeah, to a. a, a share an opinion um and but humor is often disarming and it it, it it can diffuse um what would otherwise be possibly tense situations or, or awkward discussions so I, I think you can use it um, i think there's a, i think there's been some research that you know I, I think all of us are kind of on the same page of we don't really like to use ridicule ridicule as a tool for for communication but I think there is some research that in some cases it kind of is useful. The problem is it's like, you don't want to be a jerk at the same time. But uh, for those fence sitters who are kind of like, well, maybe there's something to this, maybe it's not. If you can really put it over the top of how ridiculous something is, if they're being honest with themselves, and again, they haven't made an opinion one way or another, they can be like, wow, that is really crazy. But with, look, Celeste just says that humor and, and humility can work wonders. I think that, yeah. that's, that that's that's important. And I always use myself as an example of the, the weird things that I've believed and how I came to realize that perhaps I was wrong. So, yeah. Um, it, it, you it's know, just nice being nice to people. Yeah. It, don't be a dick still applies. It, it, it's, it's, well, maybe it's not, don't punch down. I mean, use humor, but don't punch down. Yeah, you know, yeah. So. Yeah. that too 
Yeah. Um, if, the, if, the if the government is funding space poltergeist research, calling it space poltergeist research is useful because <laughs> that, that spreads a funny thing. But don't yell at someone in your class or in your bar or whatever it is. It's like, well, you believe in nonsense. Right. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Um, and I agree with the, the uh, what Daniel's just put in there, that it's useful, uh, but not necessarily in itself critical thinking. Um, it's, it's more of a, communica a communication strategy, really. Yeah. I mean, sadly, again, the psychology is very clear on this, unfortunately, that uh, evidence is not very good at convincing people. Um, and yeah. that's kind of why we do what we do at AIPT Science is um, we kind of disarm you first with the, uh, with the pop culture stuff and hope we can sneak the evidence in underneath your guards. Um, so, so as we're wrapping up, do any of you guys have any questions for each other before we close? This is great. This was yeah. fun. Yeah, I enjoyed no, I'm, it. I'm, I just had a real good time. <laughs> <laughs> Not a question, but I, I, I'm absolutely in awe of your uh, Philip K. Dick box set back there from the Folio Society. It's like I didn't oh, know yeah. that existed until today. I'm like, oh, I need that. It is. Yeah, yeah. It is. <laughs> like magical yeah. and it's I so it's one of those things where I feel guilty like because it's just like I it's like I don't want to touch it because it's like so nice but it's yeah. like I I also do like it's a book so I want to pick it up and sit down with it and read it but I also just want to like put it on like a glass case that I could never <laughs> it's, it's not actually one big dick it's actually got smaller dicks inside so this, <laughs> name, so. Yeah, this is the yeah. shit I have to put up with <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, Logan, did, Logan, did it come in a bag of dicks? <laughs> Logan mentioned, uh, can't wait to read DOT. Is So right now, this is issues. Is it going to be in trade at some point? I'm guessing yes. Yeah. The the first trade's already in stores. Um, oh, okay. nice. It'll oh. be out in uh, October if issue 13 isn't late, but it might be, so maybe November. <laughs> <laughs> but I mentioned, uh, this might have been before we actually officially started, I mentioned to somebody... Uh, earlier, um, comics is all about double dipping and kind of like what we're doing here. Like we're doing the live show and then everything's going to be on mm -hmm. YouTube. Comics, you put out the floppies and then you make the trade and then you get money twice. Yeah. <laughs> everybody wins. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, I guess we're done here. I don't want to keep two people too long. Uh, this has been great. Uh, before I forget, we got to thank the technical people who have been handling everything today. Mitch Lampert, Craig Sachs. This literally could not have happened without them. Uh, and Benny Pollock. Hey, Mitch. And Benny Pollock, the Zoom master, who uh, gave some great advice about uh, all of this today. We just kind of put this together really quickly. I mean, it was like three weeks, maybe a month when I said, oh, I should start talking to people about doing something. The summer's almost over. <laughs> and um, you guys, everybody today just jumped on the opportunity. Uh, if anything, this is a great show that uh, people really do care and uh, they'll give their time uh, for free uh, to often to uh, help educate and do it in a fun way. So thank you guys for being here. Thank all the presenters who are here today and everybody who showed up. Um, I think this is pretty much an unqualified success. So maybe we can all do it again sometime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Always talk about weird shitology. Just yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you so much, guys. I'm going to close it down. Uh, we'll see you on the flippity flip, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Have a good one. Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye.